Take me through the day of September 11th, 2001, as you experienced it, as you lived it. September 11th, 2001, uh, it was a bright, beautiful, sunny Tuesday morning. Uh, it was late summer. Uh, there's a lot of folks who go to the beaches in New Jersey call it the short summer. It's, uh, everybody's left there for Labor Day, but it's still beautiful enough to enjoy the weather. Um, I left my house about uh, 6.30 in the morning, and uh, my four-and-a-half-year-old daughter uh, said to me, Daddy, which truck are you driving today? Um, the fire truck, the oil truck, or the boar's head truck? Because uh, I had three jobs at the time. Um, most New York City firefighters and police officers, EMS, we uh, you don't make the most amount of money. So in order to live in that city, you have to uh, you have to hustle. And my wife stayed at home raising the children. So my daughter said, oh, so you should be safe because you're on the oil truck. I said, I told her I was going on an oil truck that day. So she said, you should be safe today, Daddy. So I left and um, worked for this great company on the North Shore, Staten Island, Quinlan Fuel. Uh, very nice people. Treated me very well. And uh, it was my first day back, actually, for the winter season. Um, I usually get laid off a couple months in the summer because things, you know, too hot to need oil. So I took the truck, started my route uh, that day, and uh, plane hit the tower. So initially, I'm like, oh, it's probably some silly Learjet pilot, and he veered off track to get a better picture for a client, and uh, he hit the building. Probably hit a, you know, bad turbulence, uh, gust of wind. It's very windy down in that area of Manhattan. So that was my first thought. Can we pause there for a second? So 6.30 a.m., you wake up, you leave, and then the plane hits at... 8.45, a.m. Yeah. It's yeah. so, uh, just interesting how you phrase it. So how did you hear that a plane hit something? I, um, I'm a big news radio guy, uh, news guy, bit of a buff. I've been that way since I was a kid, and I had the news radio on uh, the local New York radio station. And as I was driving the truck, I heard, uh, you know, a uh, emergency report uh, this just in aircraft has just struck the World Trade Center. And uh, where Quinlan's is located, it's on the north rim of Staten Island, uh, which is right on New York Harbor. And uh, you could see Statue of Liberty, you know, a mile or two away in your distance, and then past that is the towers. So I just literally stopped the truck and looked out, and I saw the, the smoke. So there was smoke. Oh, it was dark, black smoke. It was just, yeah, I mean, it was burning fully at that point. And, uh, Did you have fear of what the hell happened or is I was I was initially scared for anybody involved uh I realized I said there's there's going to be lots of fatalities obviously depending on the size of the aircraft and uh you know uh the the business day there had started probably at 8 eight thirty, so those buildings should have been packed at that moment so that was a thought across my mind um but from our our uh, being responder perspective if you're off duty normally you you do not go to a scene uh they don't want you to because of accountability and safety uh the on-duty platoon will handle it and if it's something very horrific then they will have something called a recall which is any police firefighter or ems personnel is obligated to go to their command immediately uh check in with you know their command get their gear and stand by and await orders for deployment uh, or to remain in that command for routine duties. How often throughout history have, have there been recalls? I believe the one prior to that was like in the 1968 riots, uh, possibly, and then maybe in the 70s, there was uh, another blackout and riots. And I remember my dad talking about it, and he actually always said, just remember if something bad's going down, don't just rush in, you, you, you will wait the recall, or at the very least, if there isn't a recall, you get to your firehouse. And because if you show up somewhere, there's a good chance that no one knows you're there. And now you, in your well-intended uh, movements, you you get lost or trapped or no one's looking for you. So that's the whole thing with, you know, checking in and now you're with a squad or, you know, group of guys and, Everyone knows, you know, hey, there's Nels, there's Lex. Okay, they're on, you know, this team. So 
I uh, I said, all right, they're not going to need us. It's probably going to be a fifth alarm, and you know there'll be 250 firefighters there. They'll handle it. It's going to be a bad day for those guys, but you know our guys take on some heavy stuff, and they'll be fine. A few minutes later, um, the second plane hit, and I knew immediately. I'm like, okay, uh, we're under attack. So I just flew the truck back in. I told uh, my boss, I have to go. He understood, he knew something was way wrong, and uh, I just was flying. Uh, at the time, I actually had a yellow Volkswagen Beetle, uh, kind of a goofy car to be driving, but I loved it. So for people who are just listening, you're kind of a big guy. Well, yeah, I could. I, I definitely <laughs> need to lose about 50 pounds. No, yeah. I don't mean in that way, yeah. your well, frame, as, as big my, hands. As my beloved friend Bobby Adams would say to me, <laughs> I, I, uh, I was driving around in a clown wagon, and he also says I have a waving, <laughs> waving hairdo, waving bye-bye, so thanks, Bobby. Uh, <laughs> Good but yeah, he's a great friend. Uh, yeah, so I took the Volkswagen and I flew in and I was heading over to Verrazano Bridge and uh, hit the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And my phone rang and my wife normally doesn't uh, curse or raise a voice and she was yelling at me and she said, don't go in there, go to your firehouse. Well, first she asked where, she knew I was on the way, but she just wanted to know where. And um, I said, I'm on, I'm on the curve, which is, 65th Street on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway called Dead Man's Curve. We we actually used to do a lot of car wrecks up there. And uh, I was hitting that curve pretty fast. And then right around the curve is the exit to the firehouse. And I had to decide, well, am I driving right in to the battery tunnel to the city or am I going to the firehouse? And then I said, but I have no gear. I, I'm i going to be ineffective. How do I show up with no gear, no protection, no, you know, so... She said, do what your dad would follow the recall, go to the firehouse. And I said, hung up the phone, said, I love you, got to go. And I did, I went to the firehouse. And uh, I'm glad I listened to her. I had my father ringing in my ears. Uh, my dad, beautiful guy, he's uh, 82, did 34 years in New York City Fire Department. He uh, he came down with end stage non-Hodgson's lymphoma. Uh, he's 38, back in, uh, going on 39, 1978. And uh, this guy, he, uh, he's my hero. He, um, he was going to die. They sent him home. They said, you, there's really not much we can do. Go get your affairs in order. And he says, but Doc, I have three young kids. And, and uh, she, she called him a couple hours later. She said, um, I, I got in touch with Sloan Kettering, and uh, they have a new, uh, new drug. We want you to be a test pilot. And he's, she's, he said, uh, hey, Doc, I'm a... He's got a heavy Brooklyn accent. I'm a fireman. I'm a fireman. I'm not a pilot. And uh, so she said, no, no, we want you to try this drug out. And it's, it's uh, if it works, we may have some success. But if not, he says, yeah, I'm going to die. So let's do it. So uh, every every two weeks for four years, he'd, uh, he'd go for treatment. But uh, he was assigned to a desk job after that, after the the uh, cancer tumor removal and, you know, the heavy treatments. And he'd get up every morning at 4 o'clock in the morning and he'd uh, he'd walk down to the train station in Staten Island, take the train, and then he'd, uh, he'd take the ferry across the harbor and he'd get off looking at the towers and then he'd take a subway into Brooklyn. And on uh, every other Thursday, he'd leave at noon and do the same exact reverse route and he'd get to the cancer center and uh, my mom would meet him, and uh, he'd get his infusion. And within two hours, he'd be violently ill for uh, a few days, really badly ill. And I just remember, um, you know, he's ten years. I was ten years old, and uh, he just had to have the room darkened out. And he he'd be so sick, and I'd just go in and wipe the vomit from his face, just try to give him a little water, but he couldn't take it down because he'd throw it up. And uh, Maybe on Saturday, you start coming around a little bit, drink down a little bit of tea. And on Sunday morning, he he put his robe on, he'd go down, mom would make him black coffee and toast. And he'd sit up, watch the news, watch a game. And then Monday morning, he'd go back to work. And he did that for four years. And uh, he's 82, and he's still here. <laughs> uh, you said that your dad's a man of a few words, but when he talks, they're profound. 
So yeah. what what words were ringing in your ear when you were driving? I just always remember them saying, kid, they give the recall. You go to the firehouse. You don't go where you think you should. You go to the firehouse. You follow your orders. So do the smart thing. Do your job. Yes, sir. And every time we'd hang up the phone, it's fireman talk. He'd say, I love you. Keep low. My dad couldn't tell me he loved me until um, I told him when I first got on a fire department. I was 22. And my dad grew up in a tough household. My granddad was a, a good man, but a tormented man. He he was sent away from home at 12 years old. Um, um, he was in, from Denmark, and I'm named after him, Grandpa Nils. And uh, I think his demons took up a large part of his life, his his anger, his whatever it was, his fear. I, I, I We got the sense that maybe when he was a child, he was an apprentice baker, you know, living with strangers, working for them. And we, we think maybe he was abused, and that's why he took it out on my, my dad and my grandma and my aunts. But... Um, they uh, they made it up to each other at the end of my granddad's life. My granddad turned out to be the best grandfather ever. He I think he tried to heal and heal everyone by his change of behavior. So he's proof that uh, you can change, you can improve if you work on it. But uh, I know I'm going off track here. But uh, oh, you, but you were man enough in your you said in your twenties to tell your dad my dad, love, yeah, and my dad. You love um, him? I got on a job. And, uh, he said, I had to go, kid. Uh, I was the tour. I was, we called tour duty. I said, oh, that was great. It was great. I love it. And he goes, well, just remember, you keep low. You always keep low. And keep low means you stay down below the flames. You know, if a room flashes over and it's it's burning, you if you stay up high, you're going to get burned badly. But if you get down on your belly and you crawl, you'll get out. So he'd always say that when you hang up the phone. And I said, well, I love you, Pop. And he says, oh, well, thanks, kid. I said, <laughs> I said, well, you can say it too. And uh, Oh, nice. You pressured him. And he did. He and did? he said it. And now every time we talk, he says it. So, you know, um, <laughs> you know, they, they talk about masculinity and whatnot. And uh, my dad is one of those tough, tough guys with a soft edge. And that's, that's how he brought me up, um, you know, to uh, be a protector. I hate bullies. I was uh, bullied really badly as a kid. And uh, I really hated it. And, and now I, I find myself sometimes throwing myself into situations to protect people that are being, you know, violated and hurt. And uh, I just can't walk away from it. But that's my dad. My dad uh, was that, you know, just a great guy. But anyway, yeah. You still listen to you. Therefore, see, you you probably want to rush right to the to the towers, but you went. Yeah, so anyway, I got, I, I did, I listened to him. I listened to my wife. I went to the firehouse and it was really strange. It was eerie because, um, the computer dispatch system was was still beeping, um, which meant it it sent a dispatch and the truck received it. Ladder one fourteen, my my truck company received it and they left. They were gone. So it was this beautiful old building built in the eighteen eighties with a spiral staircase, just a narrow old brick garage, and it was empty. And I just heard the computer chirping, and I looked down on a ticket. And it said, Ladder 114, respond, Vessian West World Trade Center aircraft into building. And I said, oh, God, I just hope they're not on a death ride because this this now was two towers and uh, they were burning. They were free burning. And, and I knew this was really, really bad. And uh, I got on the phone and I called command right away. I called the 40th Battalion and, uh, you know, chief's, chief's aide just said, look, you know, get 12 guys, sign them in to the journal. There's a journal of daily events. Every Everything that takes place in the firehouse 24 seven has to be logged. And I logged myself as coming in, reporting for, reporting for duty. Um, and as the guys came in, I logged them in. And then uh, one of our lieutenants took command we grabbed up a bunch of gear and they basically told us get 12 guys, get a city bus and get down to the battery, the battery tunnel. They, they said it would probably be closed. There was threats. It was going to be blown up to get to the Brooklyn bridge. And, uh, so we did, we got a city bus. We flagged it down and the bus driver said, I'm sorry, I can't give you the bus. I will drive you. And he took us and we stopped at engine 201, which is, just about a quarter mile down the road from us, uh, that's our affiliated engine company and my uh, my my childhood best friend uh, here, Johnny uh, Shard was. He was assigned there and he was on shift, and uh, and they went through the tunnel, 
And uh, we picked up those guys, the off-duty guys from 201, and then we kept going down 4th Avenue, and we picked up 239's crew. And then we hightailed it down the bridge, and um, there was a lot of traffic. There was a lot of people fleeing, coming over the bridge in, in waves, so it affected uh, the inbound. What was the mood like? Uh, among the um, crew? It was somber because just prior to getting on the bus, the uh, first tower went down. So we, we, we figured that I had heard 114, uh, my lieutenant, Dennis Oberg, I heard him on the radio and he, uh, he said, 114, uh, Manhattan, we're on your frequency. What's, you know, what do you need us? And they said, uh, Tally Ho, which is our nickname, Tally Ho responded in the Vesey and West to the command post and uh, receive your orders. And I heard Dennis say, Tally Ho, 10 4. And uh, Dennis, a little while after that, they were proceeding to go into, I believe it was, I get this mixed up and I'm sorry, I should know this by the back of my hand, but sometimes it's just such a, a haze. But the second tower hit was the first one to go down. And um, they were heading over to go in it. And all of a sudden he looked up and he saw like what he thought to be disintegration. And he turned the guys around. He said, run, just run. Don't look back. Don't look up. Go. They sprinted as fast as they could. And uh, they dove under a fire truck. And the guys that were sprinting behind them 40 feet away were underneath a pile that was 10 stories deep. They they were killed. And just further into that pile was his rookie son, who Dennis's rookie son, who was working in Ladder 105, which was my first command on the department. I worked for proudly served for three years. And just aside them was my childhood best friend, John Chard, and his uh, his crew from 201. And uh, they, they were all killed. And the strange irony to, um, to that is that Dennis, Dennis's son, Dennis Jr., was working underneath the, uh, under the wing of a senior man, as we say. A senior man is a guy with a lot of experience, and he'll, uh, he'll watch over you, make sure you don't, you don't veer off. Like I veer off a lot of talking, and uh, you don't veer off, and you get yourself hurt. In the morning of 1993 bombing, Henry Miller was my senior man. And I was the young guy under his wing. And he protected me. And toward the end of the day, he looked around and he said, kid, it's a bad day. And he said, they didn't do it right. They blew it up in the middle. If they did it in a corner, they would have dropped this building half a mile down a Canal Street. But don't kid yourself, they'll be back and they'll do it and they'll do it right next time. And it's so strange and so prophetic because he was there with him and he died with Dennis. He knew it. And in like 1994, we had a training manual with a picture of the towers, with a target. And it said, not a, not a matter of if, but a matter of when, be prepared. And it's one thing, it was like people knew, right? And we didn't stop it. And uh, so we got off the bus, but just prior to that coming over the bridge, the second tower is gone now. And we're just destroyed because we're like, our oh, guys are there. They're all in there. Now we're feeling like cowards because we got there late. And initially we're thinking there's 500 guys that are gone because it was a 10th tent, alarm assignment, which means 50, 60 fire trucks, uh, five to six guys per, you know, you're looking at at least, you know, it was even more, a tenth alarm plus multiple alarms on top of it. It, it. it was a dispatch, basically equivalent of five to 600 firefighters. And we figured, oh, they're all, they're all in there, they're all gone. All the police officers, Port Authority police, NYPD police, court officers just up the street from the courts, transit cops from the train tunnels. Like just, you know, we knew everybody was going and uh, now they're gone. So you, what you saw, what, what were we looking at? What did it look like? So you saw rubble and then you knew that many, that 105 and 201, many of those guys are in the, they're dead. Yeah, what, and we thought what 114 was in there too. We didn't realize at that point, we didn't even realize that they had gotten under that truck. We thought they were all gone, but yeah, it looked like, like it looked like 
it looked like a movie scene with just end of the earth destruction. It's just massive piles of intertwined steel, what was left of the steel. And, and, you know, there was no cement. It was all just dust. And it was just a burning pile of, of dust and concrete and, and plastic. And it was just, everything was just pulverized. And it was, it was truly hard to mentally compute that. Like, it was like, what? And then there was just fighter jets couple of fire just just circling and and you just heard the <laughs> flying by over your head i mean you literally see the guy banking the turn around the brooklyn bridge and just coming back and i'm like holy shoot we're under attack and we we couldn't really get concrete intel as to what exactly we knew planes but then we kept hearing there was multiple devices there was devices in a battery tunnel and there was devices on a george washington bridge and in the subways and it was just it was just chaos it was i mean we kept it together obviously because that's kind of we try that's what we do but the the just constant barrage of different reports it was like holy shoot and then as we were being deployed it was a little frustrating, but they were trying to take command and send us in groups now because they realized we have to start searching this there's you could hear the the alarms on the on the Scott Air Mask, the the packs we wear to go into the building. It has a motion alarm, and if you stop moving for thirty seconds, it just sounds like this whining, you know, this screaming bell. Like it, it just keeps going and going. And you could hear multiple units of those going off, and you're like, "Wait a minute, there's guys with those. Like, where are they?" <laughs> and it's emanating from underneath the pile, and. Wow. You know, it was it was just surreal and um, truly like like a, like a, a war zone. You know, I, I mean, I was a soldier in the reserves, and I never saw combat, and I would never claim that I did. But you know, we trained, we trained for a lot of situations, and we trained in you know real life atmospheres and whatnot. And this was just beyond that by leaps and bounds. It was it was bizarre. I, did you see the towers collapse as we were coming over the bridge? I, the first one. We were, as we were deploying from the firehouse, we had a television on, and I saw it go down. And it just, it was just like, and, and you know, we were so involved in, in getting gear together and, and getting, okay, you know, team set up, and okay, you're going to be with these two guys. And these, you know. and I just yelled, those the guys, and, and they're looking at me. I, I dropped to my knees, and I started praying. They're like, what, what the hell's wrong? I said, I couldn't even say. It's like, oh, 114, they're in there. And, and they're like, what? I said, the tower's gone. And all you saw on the TV was just this pile of dust. And I guess because they didn't see it going down, they probably thought I truly lost it. And and then then the realization came was like, oh wow, the tower's down. So now it was like, wow, this is really on. So we we just took off and got that bus. And uh, so if you thought many of the guys on one fourteen were dead, if you thought that, did you think you're going to? die i mean if you're rushing into the towards the rubble i as crazy as it sounds i never thought that the other tower would go down i said okay maybe some freak chance that one went down but no the other one's not gonna go like they're built so strong yeah. you know i was in those towers so many times and i mean i ate dinner up in the top floor restaurant windows on the world and i'm saying nah there's no way like like how the hell did this one happen but i i was having a hard time mentally processing that the building was gone. And 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 believe me, if if you don't have fear in this industry and you know, police, fire, military, then you're you're kidding yourself or you're a danger to everyone. I don't care who it is, as tough as they are, this and that. Everybody has a certain level of fear with doing this. And I don't care how long you do it, there's always that chance of something going bad and and everyone who does it has that certain amount of fear but at that point it was such a feeling of disbelief that fear wasn't even kicking in it was just like what the hell just happened and i, I honestly think it was almost like a shock and and it just stayed that whole day um so the building is before it collapses is burning it's just burning i mean upper floors it's you know up in the 78th up to the 80s and then it's you know there's the way that the cut was from the plane, it wasn't just straight across. It was, you know, from the 78th, then, you know, on up to maybe the 86th. And, you know, um, then 
the jet fuel had come down and was burning down and there was people on the on the ground who were doused with jet fuel that was already burning and they were lit on fire on the ground it, yeah. it was it was just insane how vast the destruction path was as a firefighter what are you supposed to do with that scale of fire or i i think the first bosses in the first chiefs we're just going to do their best to get as we we get hose lines what, what our whole theory is or our tactics is to get water at the fire at the base of the fire and get the truck company which is the ladder company they, they're the guys who break the doors down put ladders up this and that yeah. to get them to where the life is most expected and get them out of there so i think the chief's tactics at that point was let me get multiple engine companies let me get four five six hose lines fighting this fire this massive fire and let me get 15 20 truck companies up there just yoking people out of there yeah but you gotta and, go up the stair everything's not working you gotta yeah guys had to walk up 80 80 90 100 flights of stairs and there's audio of of officers and firefighters speaking to each other on the radio channels and unfortunately at that point in time we had very very bad communication system we've been fighting for years to get radios that work properly we couldn't because it was a lot of money we fought for years to get the full bunker firefighting suits, which is the pants and the coat. Mm -hmm. We used to have just coats and these roll up rubber boots and guys were burning to death and we had to fight. And unfortunately we lost three guys in one vicious, vicious fire in 1994. And then they finally said enough's enough, give these guys the gear. So it's a strange phenomenon in the, in the first responder world and in the military world. It's really one of the most important things that takes place in society, the most pertinent organizations, and we can't get the funding we need. It's crazy. They'll throw money at every nonsensical thing, but when it comes to gear, equipment, protective equipment, trucks, this couldn't get it. Just all the ways you could take care of people. I saw in since 9-11, the wars in the Middle East have cost America over $6 trillion. Yep. And the amount of that money that was spent on the soldiers, in this case, the first responders, is minimal. Compared to it, yeah. Almost nothing. They, 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 Lex, they closed down, I believe it's either seven or eight. In May of 2002, they closed down nine firehouses in New York City for budget reasons. We hadn't even finished cleaning up the World Trade Center site and they slashed the budget and still to this day have not reopened those firehouses. There's a million more people now living in New York City than there were in 2001. And the fire protection is, is way less than it was. And it's, it's a sin. It's really a sin.